Welcome to Spiritually Danger Close. I'm your host, the Latter-day Retainer. This podcast will primarily be the reading of previously posted blogs from Blogspot of the same name. The blogs are things that I feel impressed to talk about. I want to add some depth to ideas, which leads to some research into them. The expressed viewpoints are mine and not necessarily that of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All right, I wanted to get this recording out of the way. Uh, For again, caveat, my two cats decided that my desk is the only place in the apartment that they can play throw paws. So I do apologize if I am interrupted or am distracted because they're running back and forth in front of my monitor. Now, where was I? Ah, there we are. The good old days. How many times have you heard people or even yourself do so lament about the good old days? Whether it is meant by being back on a mission prior to marriage or in some cases the desire to have been in an earlier history of the church. I personally and freely admit that I have been guilty of this, especially at times when I was at odd against my God and breaking the covenants that I had made with my eternal father. Oh, that I was a missionary again, the things would be different. I was so spiritual on the mission compared to now. There is no way myself then would have done what I have done now. As some of you who follow me on Twitter may have seen, this has been on my mind as late, so much that I have had the promptings of the Holy Spirit to say something. What made it clear as a seer stone was somebody recently tweeted about coming back to church. They have had a long journey in repentance and were declaring that they would return to their old righteous self. I believe that without a doubt that this is a spiritual trapping of the eternal adversary. This idea of the good old days is a snare that adversaries so easily disguises. To prove this to you, I will be clear about my personal repentance and will share some very deeply personal conversations I have had with my God. Post-mission, I served a mission from 2010 to 2012 in the United States in one of the Southern missions. It was a very long, hard two years. I learned a lot and I grew closer to my God. I had witnessed miracles. I had experienced precious gifts of the spirit as described by Moroni. My last week in the mission wasn't even spent in my assigned area. I had permission to spend the last week in my previous area as I had the honor of baptizing a very precious soul who was, to their stubbornness, refused to allow anybody but I be the priesthood holder to perform their ordinance. The mission president had a district conference before in which he pulled all the missionaries aside who would be going home soon. There he challenged us to pray so fervently that we would receive a confirmation that we had magnified our callings and did what we were to do as missionaries. That final Sunday, my heart was so full, the spirit was so clear, I had done what the Lord had expected me to do. While I didn't do everything as I should have, I repented of my mistakes and I strived to finish strong. My mantra in the last month of the mission was 2 Timothy 2, verse 4. While I could go into detail about this more, it digresses from the point which I loved my mission. I wish I could have stayed longer. I even dreamed about staying longer. The next six months post-mission became very dark. I started back into sins that I thought I had repented of. I was angry about the YSA ward I was in, which is a story for another time. All the clarity of purpose I had prior coming home was immediately lost. The plans I felt so strongly about didn't seem right. I became indecisive as to what my course of action should be. At the time, I wished so much to be back on my mission. Even though I wasn't baptizing left and right like the other elders and sisters, it was comfortable to me. I had a purpose that was so clear. Preach my gospel. While my state president did give me a very special priesthood blessing, I still felt lost as to what was the right course of action. Military. I really wanted to study languages, so I had a meeting with the head of the Arabic department at BYU. A brunette hair, green-eyed woman who was a junior gave me a campus tour. I felt like it was a good option for me, but the problem was, as a 2.5 GPA high school student, I had no scholarships. That's also when I recalled some previous companions who were reservists in the U.S. military, and they mentioned the ROTC and commissioning to become an officer. As much as I wanted to, all, all the ROTC classes were full at the time. I would have had to wait three semesters to get into the ROTC class. This is when I came across the path that led to where I currently am. Unless the military get benefits... Some, most have heard of the Montgomery GI Bill, but what most don't know is all branches, to include the new US, U.S. Space Force, offer active duty tuition military assistance. I found a recruiter that enlisted. I wanted a job to do that would be fun while I was studying part-time. While this is possible, it's not a very fast-track option. Taking six classes a year without tapping into my GI Bill, I finally earned my associate's degree after four years. My time 
as enlisted hasn't been without bumps. When you join the military, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will send you a letter with information provided by the Military Relations Department. In that letter, this is a stark warning about staying away from the vast amount of temptations. It is ominous for a reason, as many become less active after entering military service. I even met a woman from Idaho that was fleeing from what sounded like an arranged marriage and was using the military service to get away from her home life. I'm not sure what the actual statistic is, but from my current knowledge, it's very high percentage. If I had to guess, it's more like 70% going less active on entering military. I was one of those who went less active. Not even six months in, I was breaking the word of wisdom, and I was going to places that no return missionary should go. I was one of the boys. I was one who had wandered to the great and spacious building. One night in a drunken stupor, I cried and lamented my situation. Oh, that I had gone to BYU like a good return missionary. I threw a pity party for myself, and I started becoming self-destructive and uncaring what happened. Between 2013 and 2018, I went through various stages of activity with the church. I had one foot in the great and spacious building and one trying to reach across the chasm to the iron rod. It doesn't take an engineering major to know that this will not work. Repentance requires a complete abandonment of sin. By 2018, I went to the branch president and confessed my sin before a judge of Israel. While expecting excommunication, I was fully prepared for the long journey ahead. However, the district council felt that I had come freely and was willing to work through the repentance, that formal probation fit the circumstances if I tried. Repentance. Can anyone guess what the first book I was asked to read during my repentance process? Well, if you said that it would have been the miracle of forgiveness, you would be right. It was harsh, strict, and blunt about sin. Some like this, but for me, I knew... What I had done was wrong. I personally did get some spiritual promptings from the book, but that's when it hit me. Oh, the good old days of the mission. I thought of those memories and reflected on my mission. If I were as spiritually strong as I was then, I wouldn't be in my current predicament. I recalled hearing about a book by Callister who took all his notes from the atonement and wrote an exhaustive book on the subject. One shopping cart later and a week for delivery, I cracked the book open. I started to feel the same enthusiasm as I felt as a full-time missionary. I was getting back into my former glory. Quote, as we expand our knowledge on the atonement and increase our love for the Savior and for the cause which he suffered, our hearts begin to soften and more readily yield to the motivation, powers of his sacrifice. We find new reservoirs of commitment to serve the living God. Eventually, there emerges a new personal burning resolve that his suffering shall not have been in vain, end quote. Callister from 2000. Repentance is meant to be uncomfortable, and any person who says otherwise is not of God. The prophets and apostles of the true and living church, the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, have always talked about the difficulty of repentance. Five minutes into the reading of Miracle Forgiveness, you'll see how evident this is. In Luke, we read of a rich man who came to Jesus for wisdom. Christ said, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou has and distribute unto the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come follow me luke eighteen twenty two. what did the young man do and how did he respond well he left when he heard quote when he heard this he was very sorrowful for he was very rich end quote quote people need to understand that repentance isn't changing what we do it's closely related to what we are and what we believe. When we truly repent, we change our hearts and our minds, not just our behaviors, end quote, Walker, 1992. This is what I was learning during my repentance process, yet I still felt the desire limitation. Oh, the good old days. I was like, too, like the rich old man, like the rich man. I wanted to walk away as repentance was uncomfortable. It by very nature meant to be looking at what in the military mind straight is the phrase I use as, quote, the only easy day was yesterday, end quote, which was something I would say from time to time as a missionary during hot days and hot weather and sweating liters of water. Christ asked us very simply and yet so commanding, quote, come follow me, end quote. I needed to pick up the cross, and carry the burden a bit. I needed to feel the pains of Gethsemane. 
That doesn't mean that I'm saving myself, as the scriptures are very clear on this. Quote, wherefore redemption cometh in and through the holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Come is a commanding word. It by nature means listen and then act on doing something. Simply, we can argue this must be discipleship. This is what Christ is asking us. In feudal Japan, there was a structure, very present, a shogun or a master and a retainer or a disciple. In one of the books on the samurai, there was a very powerful statement on what it means to be a good disciple. Quote, a man or woman is a good retainer to the extent that he or she earnestly places importance in his master. Yamamoto, translation 1979. If we place importance in our master, Jesus the Christ, we will be willing to follow him. True change requires effort, effort which I believe moves us further than where we have been. Even though I may have sinned so great to be placed on probation, there was some hope at the end of the tunnel. Quote, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. End quote. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Even as embarrassing it was for a year to skip the sacrament cup and bread, sometimes to be asked by a young child, why didn't it take the sacrament? I knew my reward in enduring to the end was to be exquisite. Quote, we endure to the end by continuing to apply the principles throughout our lives and inviting the Lord to change us. Enduring to the end means changing to the end. I now understand that I am not starting over with each failed attempt, but with each try, I am continuing my process of change. End quote, Craven 2020. We don't need to drink the bitter cup. Christ already did that for us. He does give us a special promise and discipleship to him. Quote, come unto me, all the, ye are labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. End quote. Matthew 11, 28 through 29. At the end of the year and three months of formal probation, I was once again allowed to partake of the sacrament. By the following, by January the following year, I was able to go to a temple rec for a recommend. I'd gone to a bottom of a pit, but through the merits of mercy in Christ, I was able to repent. As we come, quote, as we come closer to God, we see our imperfections and nothing plainer and plainer, end quote, Phelps 1836. One of the imperfections I became keenly aware of was the notion of the good old days. Marathon. Well, I believe this to be a trap of the adversary symbol. By its nature, it is against the atonement. It's enduring to the end. Imagine entering a 5K marathon in your city. You decide that you want to, after some encouragement of a few friends, to enter the race. Well, the 5K is six weeks ahead, which is perfect. You have time to prepare. You watch all the videos on how to run correctly. You go to a running store. You get fitted for the right shoe. You take up at the crack of dawn for to go for 30-minute runs. You see you're improving slowly and surely, worried that you might injure yourself for a week prior. You stop training, not to potentially be injured. Race day comes, and you're here so super excited. Your family's at the finish line waiting for you to get there. They make their way over. Uh, excuse me. Uh, finish line, I do apologize. My cat moved my cursor. Your family is at the finish line waiting for you to get there. You have it all timed out. What pace you need to run, the whistle screeches, and the runners start going. You get excited. You notice you're going well. In fact, you notice that you're going a whole 30 seconds faster. This motivates you a bit more, and you start going as you finish the race is close. The bam. You feel it. A cramp is making its way into your calf. You start to feel your pace decrease, and the cramp is becoming ever more noticeable. By the three-kilometer mark, you are at a walking pace that is slowly turning into a limping gait. A whole 15 minutes later, you hobble across the finish line. While your family cheers you on there, it is self-embarrassment. Man, I knew I could have done better. While this happens, you notice the running store employee, the one that helped fit your shoes, notices you and your family at the finish line. They make their way over and ask how the race went. Well, I finished, but not as good as I hoped for, you say a little grimacingly, trying, not, trying to soothe a little cramped calf muscle. 
Well, that happens to even the professionals. I thought you were following the six week program asked the shoe store employee. Well, I was, as you say out loud, but I was worried that week prior I could hurt myself. So I stopped running. I wish I had known. I would have warned you that that would have the opposite effect. You should trail off some training, but not so completely as your body is used to the temple. You, well, you know now for next time. My question to you in this hypothetical scenario is, do you go home and lament about how the good old days were of when you were training? Sure, you were doing well, progressing, likely would have finished the race the way you wanted, yet it's all beneficial. What's something that just happened in the scenario? That something is new knowledge that you did not have. You did not know that you should stop running by going cold turkey on training. Through this experience, you're now wiser and know for the future what you should do. As it may be easier for us to lament and think back about how things used to be, it can be easy to be trapped by this thinking. Perfected through Christ. Like the scenario laid out, swap it for a mission and going for less active. Sure, I was spiritually fit. I studied the gospel every day. But what happened is that I still fell away for some time. I hadn't remembered about enduring to the end, even though for two years straight, I went door to door preaching about the basics of the gospel. My mission will always be more spiritually significant to me. Sorry, my cat is just not having it with me reporting this right now. I apologize. While my mission will always be spiritually significant to me, I know now that I was yet refined. I had weaknesses that were yet to be revealed. Giving into temptation was spiritually taking a week off. The results of sin were a spiritual cramp. That is so noticeable that we are unable to hear the still small voice of the Spirit. Quote, in a broader sense, coming unto Christ and being perfected in him places perfection within the eternal journey of our spirit and body. In essence, the eternal journey of our soul. As Gong notes, it's the Savior and great and last sacrifice that brings the much-needed mercy to be forgiven and then perfected in Christ, ye accepting the atonement. Later in the talk by Gong, he discusses the trapping of perfectionism. I think this is the other half of the coin of the good old day thinking. Reflecting on my post-mission experience, I see that I had essentially took a week off and return to the greater sins. I'll always cherish my mission and the things I learned in the two years and how I studied the gospel. I learned the ways I recognize the spirit. I experienced the gifts of the spirit, witnessed true and mighty miracles, seeing the hand of the Lord, etc. While it's nice to wish I could go back to that August in 2012 and start over and do it all again correctly, I would still be lacking some spiritual important insight and the spiritual lessons I learned along the way. By no means am I advocating for you to go sin so you can learn along the way. The point I am ultimately making is that I wasn't enduring to the end. While in my mind I was thinking the perfect truth is I wasn't as I fell away. I don't want to waste my time anymore thinking about the good old days. To end, I agree with Craven who said, quote, I now understand that I am not starting over which, with each failed attempt, but that with each try, I am continuing my process of change.